Hey everyone! Today I'd like to invite you to go on a historical journey with me. We're going to follow the travels of Marco Polo from Venice, right here on the left hand side, all the way to China, to Shangtu, which at the time was the empire of Kublai Khan. We're not going to follow the entire journey, only the way there, and we're going to skip his travels in China and the route that he took back after 25 years. It's quite a long time. But before we have a closer look at this map, let's start at the beginning. So, unfortunately, I can't show you an actual portrait of Marco Polo from the time. When did we have is this one here from the 14th century. But that's at least a hundred years after he lived. His travelling, after all, was in the late 13th century. He lived from 1254 to 1324. We do, however, have a portrait of the person that he visited. This is Kublai Khan. He lived from 1215 to 1294. And he was the founder of the Mongol Empire in China and of the Yuan Dynasty. I hope you pronounce it like this in English. And this was the official portrait, which at the time was displayed at the Imperial Palace in Beijing, which was the capital of the Mongol Empire. Also something I didn't know. But like I said, we want to start at the beginning. And that's actually not with Marco Polo himself, but with his family. Namely with Niccolo, his father, and Matteo, his uncle, who in the dialect of Venice, of Venice was called Maffeo, so the T's were pronounced as F. And these two went on a journey to Kublai Khan before uh, Marco Polo was born. In fact, by the time they came back, Marco Polo was already 15 years old and only then got to meet his father. His father and uncle stayed for about two years and then resumed the journey and left Venice again, this time with the then 17-year-old Marco Polo. And there's a story to that, actually. So they went to the Mongol Empire in China and stayed for a bit. And when they returned back, they did so on behalf of Kublai Khan, who asked them for um, a favour from the Pope to bring, if I remember correctly, holy oil from Jerusalem and missionaries. Now, there was just one issue. By the time that Niccolo and Maffeo got back to Venice, there was no Pope. The old one had passed away and it took two years to decide on a new pope. So what they did, they actually left, which we can see here. It just says this is the departure of the family polo from Venice to the Far East. And it says that this is a very realistic portrait of Venice, one of the oldest ones. 
personally, I don't know Venice well enough to identify the different buildings, but if you've been there, uh, you probably have a good idea what we see. The part that I really like about this portrait is, for one, the colour-coded um, fashion of the time. There's a light pink from head to toe, red and green. So pink tights obviously were very in, as you can see here. And the other part had these very cute and kind of shy lions just peeking out here from the bushes and the contrast to these swans. That look pretty evil. But honestly, that's a very realistic portrait of this one, if you ask me. So that's the part that I focused on here with this image. Okay, so... The three bowlers leave Venice to return to the Khan, not being able to fulfill his demands, but nonetheless deciding to go back. They make it into the Holy Land. Let's see if we have an image of that. Maybe I'll just look at the map actually to see where exactly they went. So The Holy Land's cut off here, but we can see it on this map. They leave Venice, they arrive in Akon, and then actually make it um, already across to a um, Armenian port city. So I guess there would be some more here. We can't find it on the map, the name's not included, but it says it's in Armenia and it's um, along the coast. So I'm assuming it's the Black Sea. And there they actually hear that finally a new Pope has been named. And they get orders to return to the Holy Land, to Akon, where they then meet two clergymen that um, are supposed to accompany them all the way to what is today China. So they resume their travels, but pretty quickly the two clergymen um, leave because it feels a bit too dangerous to continue for them. So it's just the three polos who continue this journey. So here in this map we see that it leads them past Mosul and Baghdad. However, we also have a different version right here where they would come from Erzurum to Tabriz and travel south further east, so they never would have made it past Mosul and Baghdad along the Tigris. We do know for certain though, that they arrived in Hormuz, where they were supposed to embark on a sea journey to get to China, which would have taken them, um, as far as I remember, about two months. However, once they got there and looked at the ships, they decided to turn around and instead go by land. And we have some lines here from the original version of Marco Polo's travels. Interestingly, this was written in an older version of French, so I can sort of um, understand that there are a couple words that I don't know. Says something like Leur nez sont moins mauvaises, et ton périsse, c'est pour ce que elles ne sont clouées de clous de fer, 
mais sont cousus de fil qu'ils font des scorches d'arbres de noix d'Inde. Car ils font battre les escorces et deviennent convoi de grandes cheval, de quoi ils font fil et en course leur nez. So if we translate this, it says the ships appear to be of low quality, um, and a lot of them actually went under because they weren't made with iron nails, but rather woven together with thread which was made from the shell of Indian coconuts. And this thread wasn't bad. Um, it actually lasted for a long time when it came into contact with salt water. However, the problem was that there were a lot of storms in the area and they were useless in a storm. Then the text continues that the ships only had one mast, one sail, and one rudder. Again, that they used wood instead of nails to put the ships together. And it's quite dangerous as there are a lot of heavy typhoons in the Indian Ocean. Carrancel Merdon fait mon grand tempeste. So, grand tempeste, I think we all understand. Great storms. And interestingly, um, the author of this book says that this is probably quite accurate. The type of ship that's being described is a Tao, which was used in uh, Arabian sea travels. And if you've been to Oman, you might have seen ships that are still built in a similar fashion. So this is definitely credible. All right, so the Polos decided to return through Persia and use a different route, namely the Silk Road, through Afghanistan to get to China. It took about four months. Um, there were less dangers um, as they perceived them, as long as you took precaution. The way back through Persia was quite difficult as they had to pass through um, deserts. As you can see here, Persian sand desert with dunes that are up to 300 meters high. It's not a particularly welcoming place. You would have been this route here. And you can see there's one desert on this side and a salt desert on the other side. They made it to Herat, then up here, a little north to the Amudaya, which is one of the large rivers here in the area. And then they had to cross the Palm here. So this is an interesting part of the journey. You can see there's one mountain here, Kongur says, that's 7,719 meters high. So the entire area is very, very high. And they basically cross through one particular corridor. Oh, I'm just gonna have to look up the name here. which is the Wachan Corridor. It's part of Afghanistan. Unfortunately, we don't have the modern states here on the map. But if you look at a map of Afghanistan, or you might be familiar with it anyway, you will notice that there is a corridor that somewhat extends and that separates uh, Pakistan in the south from the Central Asian Republics in the north. So historically, there would have been the Russian Empire in the north and uh, British controlled India in the south. And the idea was to have a bit of a buffer in between so they wouldn't meet. The corridor itself is a couple hundred kilometers long and runs at a height of 
between 2,700 and 4,000 meters. So for me, that is um, frankly hard to imagine what life on such heights would be like. And I imagine traveling there wasn't exactly easy. But it was an established route and they weren't traveling on their own. So the necessary precautions were taken. We then also have a couple of stories from this area, like that they ran into these um, somewhat strange animals. But again, these stories are credible. He also says that um, he ran into a place that he called Ispurgan, which today would be called Shebergan or Shebirgan. Might be difficult in English. This says he had the best melons of the world. They were cut into pieces and then dried in the sun before they were eaten. There are some cities that were run over by the Mongols and destroyed. Here we have a modern picture of Afghanistan. Another one from the mountains in the area. And of course the camels that helped them travel. I do like that this book includes modern photography too, to give you an idea of the landscape. Though sometimes I think it can give us a wrong idea that these places haven't changed. Which of course they have. Probably quite thoroughly. Right, and then there's another very interesting part of the travel. So we make it through Pamir and into China. So you see that they traveled here north of Tibet. So you would have a very mountainous area here in the south and the mountainous area here from Kyrgyzstan, the Tian Shan mountains. And again, quite a lot of deserts. We have a desert here. We have the Gobi Desert here in this area. And one of the questions around um, this entire book, the entire journey of Marco Polo was whether this route here could be correct. I'm gonna switch back to the other map for a moment because we can see quite clearly what the question was. So the southern route is the one that Marco Polo took, which took him up here to Shangtu. But the uh, journey that people in Europe knew of was of another road which ran north of it and this one had been traveled as you can maybe see by two different people one was Giovanni de Plano Carpini in the middle of the 13th century and one was William of Rubruck also in the middle of the 13th century so there were less than 10 years between these two journeys both of them were from the Franciscan order. Um, at Giovanni di Plano Carpini was also a diplomat and an archbishop. He traveled on account of the Pope. And William of Rupert was a missionary who traveled on account of the French king. Both of them wanted to um, basically establish relations with the Khan in what would be China here. And there's a, a very, well, I think, funny detail. 
we know of some correspondence between the Khan and the Pope in which an alliance was brought to the table. The idea was that they had a common enemy, which was the uh, Muslim Empire developing in this area. So, you know, if they had a common enemy, maybe they could work together. And the description of this correspondence says that it always followed the same pattern. The Pope would open and ask the Khan to convert to Christianity together with uh, his entire people. And the Khan would reply, demanding submission from the Pope and the entire European region. So they never really got very far in their correspondence. Right, but we do have these two Franciscan missionaries or um, archbishops here traveling this route. And like I said, they took a northern route. So further away from the one that Marco Polo took with his father and uncle. And you can see that this did not take them to Shangtu or uh, Beijing, but rather to a place called Karakorum or Holin. Now, the name probably is familiar to you. There is a mountain range called Karakorum, um, so with the same name. It makes sense as Kara, as a Turkic word that means black, and Korum basically means stone or rock. So, tells us something about the landscape. But Karakorum was also the capital of the Mongol Empire here in this area, before it was moved to Beijing, or the summer residency Shantou. And what we know of Karakorum actually sounds quite impressive. Um, there were different quarters with quite a lot of people living there who all went after their work. We know that there was a Christian quarter as well as a Chinese quarter. There were a lot of merchants, so it sounds like it was a flourishing city. But as the capital shifted, um, it lost a lot of importance. And I don't actually know if there's still a city there or if it fell to ruins. Right. Basically, the question of which route would be better is um, not really that important. Both of them run through the desert and you would move from oasis to oasis. And in the end, the question is which city you want to get to. Another point that led to Marco Polo's account being questioned is what we can see here. This would be uh, parts of the Great Wall of China, or walls, as there are numerous walls. And at the time, um, we don't find anything in the accounts of Marco Polo, so he never mentioned it at all. There are a couple other things he also didn't mention, which would have been probably odd for a European or very new and unknown. Um, but he did say at one point that it's only parts of what he's seen. I guess he just didn't come around to telling all of his stories and all of his details that he knew. But the thing with the Great Wall is that none of the other travelers mention it either. And that's probably a reason for it. So these walls were built against the Mongols against the nomads of the north. But at the time, the rulers of this area were the very um, Mongols that these walls were built against. So of course they lost their importance. There probably weren't any fortifications at the time. And so that the Great Wall of China that we think of today simply didn't exist yet because it was built. Uh, something like 200 years later. So, 
there's a reason why this doesn't turn up in Marco Polo's travels. All right. So, we are pretty sure that he traveled this way and eventually got to the um, summer residence of the Mongol Empire, Kublai Khan. We also know that he must have arrived there in summer. We can also somewhat identify the different years. Uh, they left in 1271 and probably arrived in 1274. Again, he must have been in summer as it was the summer residency, so it took him three years to get there. And they returned to Venice in 1295, so after about a quarter of a century. And traveling back took them three years. They went back by sea. Um, however, for a long time, they can actually didn't allow them to leave. And when they were allowed to leave, it was on the condition that they accompanied one of his daughters to the ruler of Persia, to the Ilkhanat, so it was also part of a um, wide Mongolian empire that had split into different parts. And they went back to Tibris and then back to Venice. In general, the um, stories that Marco Polo tells of are all quite credible, at least according to this book. There are some oddities, for example, he found a region where they used asbestos to make cloth, which is illustrated here in this medieval picture. You can see how asbestos is dug up from the soil and then washed to clean it from the earth and then put into fire to make it white. I don't know, unfortunately, what they did with the asbestos cloth. Apparently, they did not make clothing, which is good. But I was wondering whether they used it for um, maybe some special outfits for Kublai Khan, since we know that he was wearing white. White was the color of the emperor. And asbestos cloth has the uh, property to become white again when you put it in the fire. We also learn of all kinds of traditions in the area. Can we also learn that Christians live there? called a Nestorian church. Um, I don't know the specifics of Nestorian belief. Basically, there um, are some questions over the exact nature of the divine and human aspects of uh, Jesus Christ, which was a point of debate in early Christianity. So this dates back to uh, late antiquity, basically. So the Christians must have been there for a couple centuries at this point, which is quite interesting. We also have a lot of depictions of the actual palace. Here we have an imaginary image of the court of Kublai Khan. Again, this is a fantasy portrait basically from the 16th century in which he's depicted like an Ottoman ruler. Um, so, contact wasn't that close that European artists could render a realistic portrait of the Far East Emperor. And we also have some interesting depictions of what the palace might have looked like. We know that it had two walls around it. 
And we also have some images of the fashion at the time. This would have been Empress Khabi, I think. We have quite a lot of pearls here. And her beautiful red outfit. Alright, so we're just left with a final question. If we come back to the start, to Marco Polo, how do we know what we know? How did he write his book? Well, the interesting part is he didn't write it himself. Once he got back to Venice, he actually was imprisoned because Venice was at war with Genoa and Venice lost and Marco Polo became imprisoned where he met a writer from Pisa who had suffered the same fate, Rusticella da Pisa. They probably weren't in an actual prison, uh, we can assume that they lived quite a comfortable life and they probably had a lot of time so Marco Polo told his story to Rostichella who then wrote it down he was an experienced writer so he knew what he was doing and it also explains why the book was originally written in French Rostichella of course knew French as a writer at the time this was the lingua franca of the region and also of the um, of the crusader state basically so in the holy land they also used French and we have a couple of um, Venetian expressions throughout he also wrote the book basically as if he was telling it himself, so Rusticello was telling it. He was talking about Marco Polo. However, we have some later um, editions and translations in which Rusticello da Pisa disappears and we only have the name of Marco Polo that's left. So we assume that one translation was made specifically uh, emphasizing Marco Polo himself and the later ones then were based on this one translation there's not really an ending to the book per se we have some historical accounts in the end which were probably added a bit later but it somewhat breaks off at some point so you know maybe they came back to freedom and decided that they didn't want to write anymore who really knows all right Quite a fascinating story there from the Middle Ages. And in fact, I hadn't been aware that there was actually such, well, I don't want to say close contact, but that there was contact at all, I guess, between the uh, Western European forces and the Far East. In fact, I hadn't been aware that Beijing, for example, had been founded by the Mongols. They always put them rather here in this area in Central Asia. But of course, at one point, this was a massive empire that included what seems like half of Asia, even if it didn't last long. And we can see the four parts here that it broke into the Ilkhanat in Persia, the Golden Horde in southern Russia and Ukraine. We have 
the Jagatai come out here in Central Asia and then Kublai Khan would have been here and with that I think we're gonna come to an end today thank you for watching and I'll see you again next week